It's time for the chip race. Just a few weeks ago saw the launch of my co-host's new book, Poker Satellite Strategy, co-authored by Barry Carter. The book is available to buy on Amazon in paperback or on Kindle. Dara, this book is very comprehensive. It looks at all stages of the satellite. Prior to the book, you presented a webinar, though, covering similar material. The one striking difference between the webinar and the book is the structure. The book starts with the end game and works backwards. Why did you choose this structure for the book? Well, the quick answer is I didn't choose the structure, but it was actually Barry who came up with the idea. When I developed the webinar, I just did it linearly where I thought, okay, well, it's been, first of all, why you want to play satellites, then the start, the middle, and the end. But as I suspected would happen, it meant that the vast majority of the book was actually the end. So the, the beginning bits felt kind of, I'm, I'm not going to say flimsy, but there certainly wasn't as much material in them as the end game, which is really where all of the meat of satellites is. So the more I talked to Barry and the more we realized that that was the case, Barry came up with the idea of saying, well, look, since the end of satellites is where the real difference is, and that's where the biggest mistakes are made and the biggest edges are gained, that should be what we actually lead with, because this is the most interesting stuff. This is the stuff that grabs people immediately when they see just how radically different satellites play at this stage compared to normal tournaments whereas okay you play slightly different at the start of a satellite and the middle of a satellite than a normal tournament but it's not radically different the end is where it really really changes and once he'd said that it made perfect sense to me i guess it's similar to chess where chess is usually taught starting with the end game because that's the simplest and most possible to solve and then once people learning chess have mastered the end game their teachers typically work back to the middle game and to the opening so so I think it made sense for us to have a similar approach. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of the end game, that is, of course, the time when it is correct to start making ludicrously big folds. The hand we're going to revisit this week is one featuring your good friend, Carlos Welsh. Carlos is, of course, an excellent satellite player, very ICM aware. You've spoken to me in the past about thinking of ICM like a dial that sort of goes up and down during a tournament and even more so maybe in a satellite. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, at the start of a normal tournament, ICM isn't really a factor. So we play very similarly to a cash game style where we're just thinking about if this move makes chips long term, then it's a good move. But as we move through a tournament, and particularly as we move through a satellite, there become more and more situations where a hand might make a profit in chip terms. But when we actually lose, it's so catastrophic that that, that's the biggest factor so it's like you're ratcheting up a dial where you need a bigger and bigger edge to get all your chips in and also that affects your strategy in terms of variance there are certain plays which are profitable like maybe for example shoving a draw or bluffing which even though it might be profitable they're high variance plays and we have to do less of them when icm is really big as it is at the end of a satellite Okay, well, without further ado, let's hop into our DeLorean and flash back to 2018 and that fascinating hand with Carlos. As many of you out there, I'm sure, are aware, my co-host Dara has put together a very popular webinar on satellite strategy. We're joined now by former guest, Poker Pro, Poker News and 2 Plus 2 contributor, a man who purchased Dara's webinar and has been putting it to good use. Carlos Welsh, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, David. I always enjoy it. Well, Carlos, you played a hand recently, which I think may have flummoxed most, uh, but thanks to Dara's course, you did make the correct decision. Can you talk us through the hand? Yeah, so this is a hand that was on the bubble of a um, survivor tournament, which is basically a cash satellite. Um, There's currently eight players left with six seats being paid. And um, I get an interesting hand where I have around 24K. Um, I feel comfortable cashing with 30K. So I'm, I'm at the point where I feel where I'm almost able to fold my way into a cash. And so that theory gets put to the test when a hand comes up where the under the gun player shoves for 10 big blinds. We're at 600, 1200 and he shoves 12,000. The next player over calls for a third of his stack. He started with 36 K and he calls and it falls around to me on the button with pocket Kings. And again, I have 24 K, which is, 20 big blinds. I'm one of the bigger stacks. And I thought this was an interesting spot. Like, should I go with it? Because it's the second best hand in poker. Or do I fold it? Because I'm pretty close to being able to fold my way into a cash. 
Well, immediately I'm thinking you've got one of those hands that's really problematic now because, as, as you rightly pointed out, um, there is a strong likelihood you can play zero hands for the remainder of this tournament and walk away. You can also get your money in first and put all the ICM pressure on other people. So that kind of presents a much more positive situation where you don't ever have to go to showdown. Dara, in this specific situation, what are you making of the spot? Carlos sent me the spot afterwards because uh, he, he wasn't 100% sure. When, when, as soon as I saw the spot, I was pretty sure the Kings was a fold. Um, just because of the, the the way the stacks are set up, in addition to the guy who shoved, uh, who's short, and is now going to be at risk, there were two other stacks um, of about the same size uh, as the as the shover. So Carlos was comfortably clear of those. But nevertheless, I ran the spot uh, just to check. Um, that confirmed that Kings would be an absolutely terrible call. Um, it, it, it's 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 massively unprofitable. The interesting thing to to me was that aces is also a fold in Carlos's seat at this stage, um, even aces, wow. um, and it kind of makes sense when you think about it because uh, like Carlos. He's not locked up for a seat, but he's pro- he's he's like 85, 19, some, somewhere in that range. Um, so he has to be at least. He, he, that's the amount of equity he needs for the call to be profitable. With kings, he's never going to have that equity against a range because he, he, even you know ace two is, is is going to have too much equity against him. Um, so against uh, against even. Uh, one player like he, he can't call kings like even a pocket pair is going to have a lower pocket pair is going to have 18 percent equity but the reason why aces is, is is a fold is more interesting but it's because basically the pot is multi-way um like if you were up against one player then yeah you probably do have the the the, the correct equity with aces but when you're up against two players like if they have two random under pairs um you're still only going to win 60 65 percent of the time um uh, which you know, we're, and we're saying you need to you need to be winning eighty five percent of the time. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, kings. Kings is a clear fold, and aces is actually a pretty clear fold as well. And turning it back to you, Carlos, like how big a difference in your mind was the distribution of chip stacks? Obviously, you talked about the the guy shoving having ten bigs. You're sitting with roughly twenty, maybe just over twenty, and there are bigger stacks around. You're somewhere mid pack. Is that accurate? Well, the biggest stack is thirty six. So the the guy who called and the guy in the small blind in this hand, the two of them are the they're tied for first with thirty six. Uh, I have twenty four. There's another guy with twenty four. And then there's four people with twelve or less. So I'm, um, I'm, I'm towards the top here. Yeah, that's that. That's a very important point because the other guys are going to are, are obviously going to have to to move quicker. The other interesting thing that I got when I ran my analysis was obviously the I used Holder Resources Calculator, which is an excellent tool for this stuff, and that gives the the ranges for everybody. Um, everybody at the table basically once the once this the, the first guy has called the shove has to fold aces, uh, except the two the, the the two shorter stacks still to act. Um, they can call with aces, but they actually have to fold kings, which is which is quite surprising when you think about it, because they are they are one of the shorter stacks. So you think they would they would love the chance to 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 get in with pocket kings, um, but actually even for them, pocket kings is a fold. I was fairly confident that I could fold. Uh, like I, I wasn't um, too unsure about folding the kings here. I probably would have uh, been a little bit more hesitant with aces, but I, I'm confident I would have found the fold. But there's no way I would have folded kings as one of the short stacks. So that was a um, a new a new concept for me that even the short stacks can't call off with kings in a multi way pot here. Yeah, that's an interesting point because actually that's probably the thing that I get asked the most often. People send me spots where they're like 24 of 25 and there's 20 seats. The small blind shoves and they call off with the king too and they go, well, I have to call, don't I, because I'm one of the short stacks and uh, he's probably shoving any too. But actually, when you when you run those spots, uh, you, you, the calling range is still supposed to be very, very tight. And that's probably, I would say that's the most common mistake that people are making in satellites at this stage. Well, it goes to show, obviously, uh, at the end game, at the death of of um, satellite tournaments, there are these incredibly uh, extreme ICM spots, never more so when it goes multi-way. I guess multi-way really is the death uh, of, of any of your range that you can play back within these spots, Dara. 
Yeah, the death of satellites like at the near the bubble, multi-way pots are absolute death for for almost everybody because even when you have a great hand, your chances of winning against two other even random hands go way down. Well, look, I know people out there are probably going to ignore, willfully ignore this advice because, you know, they just can't stomach the idea of even folding queens in a spot like that. But really, they're burning money when they do it. Dara, your course is still available for everybody at, I believe, the very reasonable price of $75. They can get it off you at Dope Poker Coaching at gmail.com. Carlos, thank you very much for bringing this hand. I think it really uh, emphasizes all the key points Dara tries to put across in that satellite webinar, which I, of course, have watched as well. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's good value for money. If you can save money in, in that exact spot, it already pays for itself. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos.